Uh, David, it's a real pleasure uh, to have you with us today, and uh, the microphone is yours. Judith, thank you so much for, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Jason, thank you also for, for kicking this off. Uh, I want to say what a pleasure it is to be on this, to, to be on this panel, and especially to be on this panel with Junia Miatovic, my, my real friend and partner in crime over the last uh, several years. Uh, and, and also to be joined by the panelists who are, who are so excellent and, and uh, expert on these issues. So I thought what I would do, uh, and I will try to keep it brief, uh, given uh, the, the number of people who, who really have something important to offer in, in understanding the regulatory environment that I think we're starting to see in Europe. I wanna start with really just a, a kind of overview of how we got here. Um, you, where are we right now? I mean, obviously, uh, on a, it's the morning in California where I'm sitting. On a morning like this, uh, when we see uh, President Trump uh, attacking Twitter, um, and we see actually Mark Zuckerberg attacking Twitter too, and uh, and we see this this new potential effort to regulate social media in the United States. Uh, in a way, I'd say as a footnote, in a in a pretty immature and unserious way, I think what we're seeing in Europe, by contrast, um, for all the faults that we might identify in it, has been over the years um, basically an effort to address what many Europeans, uh, particularly European leaders, see as real problems, as problems of a lack of transparency of the companies, as problems of, I think, simply put, uh, dominance by social media of European public space. And, um, and I think that when we think about European moves in that context, and we think about the work that has been done by, by Dunia and the Council of Europe, by the European Court of Human Rights, uh, by myself, my mandate, my, my uh, colleagues uh, at the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, I think our focus on Europe has generally been uh, looking at questions of how to emphasize democratic principles and rule of law in Europe while dealing with these very hard questions of, uh, of regulating social media space and of dealing with the very real problems of the last several years. And, and I think it's important to, to say that at the outset because it's, I think it's valuable for us to distinguish the efforts in Europe from the real problematic authoritarian impulses that we see around the world, in some of uh, which are in European space, to be sure. Um, but, uh, but I think the focal point for us is to think about how is it that Europe can move forward in a way that is respectful of its basic fundamental rights, rule of law processes, democratic institutions. And if we think back over the last several years, which I think will lead us to the moment where we are today, I think we could see several different uh, landmarks or turning points in Europe's development of, of its own thinking around how to regulate, or at least how to think about regulating social media. Um, and, and for me, a kind of touchstone uh, part is not uh, to focus on, on terrorism, uh, actually, although terrorism and quote unquote extremism, however defined, have been a very big part of of the question has been a very big part of European, meaning EU, European Commission regulation. I think actually a good place to start is Germany in 2015. Um, and this was a moment when Chancellor Angela Merkel, to, in my view, her great credit, uh, and to Germany's great credit, said that the country would be willing to accept uh, 1 million refugees from and migrants from around the world. It was a real step. It was a real I think a, a self-definitional moment for, for Germany. But at the same time that she was saying that, we also saw across Germany, and German leaders saw this, a rise in hate speech, a rise in attacks on, on migrants, a rise in attacks on German citizens of Turkish and, uh, and Moroccan and other origin. And, and I think government officials in, uh, in Germany saw this as something, and whether they were right or wrong, they saw Facebook um, and YouTube to a large extent, to a lesser extent Twitter, 
as responsible for contributing to the rise in those kinds of attacks. And they started with an effort that we saw spread to, uh, to the European Commission. They started with an effort of creating a code of conduct, a voluntary set of principles that would involve the companies and, uh, and government and other civil society actors. And what, what German leaders saw fairly quickly was that that wasn't working as a tool to, uh, to constrain uh, what they saw as problematic, let's say, incitement to violence or even creating the environment in which incitement is, it would, would um, get a foothold. So they moved from that, that kind of multi-stakeholder approach, the kind of soft law of a code of conduct, which then was adopted in the European Commission as a code of, the Code of Conduct on Hate Speech in, in 2016, I believe, they moved, the Germans moved to the Network Enforcement Act because they did not see that, that the companies were responsive in the same way to, um, to the soft law. They would be responsive to law. They wanted them to be responsive to law. And we saw at the same time the development of, in the European Commission, in the European Parliament, of efforts that were focused um, again, not so much on the soft law, but on moving towards, towards recommendations and directives in areas like extremism and terrorist content and uh, hate speech. And, and finally now, of course, disinformation. And I think that background is helpful for us because what it suggests is that over the last several years, there's been a very serious conversation in Europe. Again, a conversation that um, I think Dunya and I would agree has not always been um, attentive in the same way that we would like on human rights and democratic principles, but it's been a fairly robust conversation. And I think that's the background that's helpful for us to think about. It's not the only background, but it's the background, background that's helpful for us to think about as the European Union begins to consider its Digital Services Act and begins to consider how to regulate uh, the companies, and I'll, I'll end there because I know there's quite a lot to to say about the Digital Services Act and our other concerns, but hopefully that framing provides us with a little bit of a launch pad to think about where Europe is heading uh, at the moment and over the next uh, year or two. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, David. Um, our next speaker is Dunja Mijatovic, uh, the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe. Um, she had served in that position since April 2018. Uh, prior to that, she was the representative on uh, freedom of the media for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And uh, prior to that, she has served as a communications regulator in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, thank you so much, Dunja, for being with us and for sharing your valuable insights. Uh, the floor is yours. Wonderful to be with all of you in cyberspace, uh, great to see that uh, many of uh, you are present and also interested to, to listen to what we have to say and to, to discuss. This really keeps me alive, this kind of um, engagement in these unprecedented times that we are all facing. And now more than ever, uh, I think uh, we need to join our voices and also our forces in order to make sure that uh, our values, our rights are preserved and, and uh, uh, really uh, respected uh, in this difficult time. I'll try to be brief uh, and not to repeat what um, uh, David uh, just uh, stated. It goes without saying that um, we agree on uh, many of uh, issues, uh, if not all, uh, that we are raising when it comes to um, uh, these rights. Uh, but I think it's important to mention that pandemic uh, has led us to harsh times and it is fomenting uh, new tensions and polarization uh, in our societies. In this context, um, technological development can be used as an accelerator uh, of these phenomena and elevate their ability, I would say, to undermine security and the democratic fabric uh, of our societies. Um, in an era uh, when humans and uh, machines are living in an ever-closing uh, relationship, ensuring that technological uh, development uh, works for and not against uh, human rights. 
democracy and the rule of law is one of the biggest tasks that states must face, but not just the state, I would say, all of us, uh, it's the biggest challenge. Uh, indeed, I, uh, I think we can all agree that uh, technology is never neutral. Um, it is very personal, I would say, uh, because it carries ethical, political, uh, and legal implications, and digital technologies can improve, of course, the quality of uh, our lives, decrease efficiency, strengthen accountability, create new opportunities. Uh, in many case, sectors of life like healthcare uh, that I tackled in my uh, previous work in the previous months a lot, uh, um, then education and employment. And it can, of course, strengthen human rights, um, protection in a variety of, of ways. Uh, but so far, uh, digital uh, development has mainly turned against users, uh, perpetrated injustices, and restricted people's uh, rights. Uh, a case in point here is privacy that I would like to emphasize. Uh, large amounts of personal data uh, is collected uh, with or without our knowledge and are used to profile us. Uh, we provide data on our health, uh, political ideas, uh, family uh, life, without knowing who is going to use uh, this data, how and why. Um, a topic that has recently uh, been uh, largely uh, discussed in several uh, states of the Council of Europe is the use of digital devices uh, to help enforce quarantine, um, orders for the progression of uh, infection, uh, and inform people about their possible exposure uh, to infected individuals. And last month, I published an opinion uh, editorial in several national media uh, outlets in which, while acknowledging the potential uh, of digital tools to strengthen the ability um, uh, to contain the spread of COVID-19, uh, I cautioned um, against the data protection risks um, that such tools would entail. Um, I therefore recommended uh, a number uh, of actionable steps, but I will not go into details about this now. Um, the European Court of uh, Human Rights has acknowledged that restrictions can take place uh, and that use of personal data may be necessary in certain emergency situations. However, the court also uh, very clearly stressed that states uh, cannot do so um, um, uh, can do so only um, under exceptional and precise conditions by offering uh, adequate legal safeguards and independent supervision. Um, we uh, have also seen, and this is also something that I would like to mention today, uh, that crisis uh, situations can be used as a pretext for uh, restricting the public sector to information uh, and introducing unnecessary or disproportionate restrictions to the exercise of the right to freedom of expression. Uh, and David elaborated already on this. Um, this is quite, I would say, counterproductive approach. Um, and in the past months, uh, parliaments, governments, and local authorities have adopted a number of measures to counter this information about COVID-19. Uh, in some instances, the authorities have been allowed to remove content and block websites where this content provides so-called false information regarding the evolution of the pandemic. This is a topic that uh, David and myself elaborated quite a long ago, um, and there are some recommendations that are still valid even more than ever before. Um, more um, generally, I think uh, states should be mindful of the obligation uh, to create a diverse and pluralistic uh, information environment and the adverse impact um, AI-driven context moderation and curation can have uh, on the exercise of the right to freedom of expression, access to information, and freedom uh, of opinion. And um, I think it's important to mention that digital technologies are, in fact, very often um, used to manipulate public opinion. There is no lack of evidence that disinformation, incitement to hatred, and violence have been propagated by tricking an algorithm of some social media platforms, including by using bots and fake uh, accounts. And this has contributed um, 
um, this has contributed for uh, to instilling fear in the population, I would say, uh, and pushing the frames of anti-democratic movements uh, and extreme right parties in particular uh, in connection uh, with election and re um, or referendum days. So um, at the end, I think um, it would be important to, to, to mention that um, um, that uh, what GNR is doing uh, and this multi-stakeholder approach uh, is something that is not spectacularly new and something that we are not uh, aware of. But I think uh, I can only once again uh, welcome uh, the multi-stakeholder process uh, created by GNI uh, initiative. States should also reinforce their monitoring uh, of human rights compliance uh, by AI systems and act any time there is an infringement of these rights. They should strengthen independent oversight uh, and empower national human rights structures to uh, engage in this field too. And it is crucial to keep human control and human liability in relation to AI. Finally, uh, states should promote digital literacy among the population and in particular in schools in order to help people understand how the digital world works uh, and recognize when it harms. Um, so with this, um, um, I think uh, I would end by saying that at stake is the society we want to live in and pass it on to the next generation. Digital technologies um, can strengthen our freedoms or oppress them they can bolster participation or become a threat to democracy. So I'm looking forward to uh, our discussion and any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dunya. Um, so uh, here we have this great fire. <laughs> Although it is uh, also quite warm already outside. Um, but uh, Dunya, David, uh, to start, um, I, I'd like to ask you to each uh, uh, elaborate a bit more on what you think the key considerations are that lawmakers uh, have working on content regulation uh, should understand about the principles of necessity and proportionality on the international human rights law. Uh, Dunya, can I ask you to respond first? Um, I think the key considerations uh, that lawmakers should understand about the principles of necessity and proportionality under international human rights law, first, I think the proportionality. Uh, uh, in order to be human rights compliant, uh, any digital tool should be the least intrusive possible. And this is something uh, I, I think we are all very much aware of. At the moment, um, as fears, uh, to public health uh, increase people's acceptance of these intrusive measures, the governments of many countries are benefiting uh, from a wider margin uh, uh, of manoeuvre, I would say, to cope with the health crisis. Uh, and in such circumstances, uh, it is crucial, absolutely crucial, that independent and competent oversight mechanisms uh, control uh, the proportionality of the measures. When it comes to necessity, uh, I would say that digital uh, measures uh, should be lifted once uh, the reason for introducing them no longer exists. I'm already uh, monitoring and unfortunately um, seeing that several member states are really not doing that. Uh, this is an important point uh, because experience shows that intrusive measures introduced to face extraordinary circumstances, and we have these situations before, like terrorism or health crisis, often remain in place or are transposed um, into ordinary law once the emergency is over. And then we are having even greater problems. It is therefore, I would say, crucial that restrictions to the rights to privacy be limited in time and subject to sunset uh, clauses uh, and the derogatory sorry, measures um, do not become the new normality. Uh, but reality uh, in the field, uh, if I can say so, is quite different, and that is why we need to uh, be monitoring even closer and focusing even more uh, on these uh, emergency measures. Uh, thank you, uh, Dunya. And, and, and David, is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, well, I, I share uh, everything that, that Dunya just said, and I, I think I would just add 
the following. I think it's, it's important to, for us all to recognize that the principles of necessity and proportionality are, are essentially one condition of, of the three main conditions that we look at when we're evaluating restrictions uh, or interferences with freedom of expression uh, or, or privacy. One is, one of the others is uh, that the restriction be provided by law. And we've understood that to mean that the law itself needs to be clear. It needs to provide guidance both to executive authorities that might impose the restrictions so that they don't have excessive discretion to decide what's legitimate and what's not. It also provides guidance to individuals, to companies, so that they know what's on the right side of the line and what's on the wrong side of the line. I think that's, that's essential because otherwise it's very difficult to evaluate the necessity or the proportionality of any particular measure. And the other question is uh, necessary for what? And, um, and yeah. that's, that means what is the legitimate objective? And for any given restriction and any given effort by government to, to restrict, I think we should be also looking to see is this, and the pandemic provides us with a good moment for this, is this restriction necessary to protect public health? Is it necessary to protect the privacy, the rights of others? I think those questions, those highlight that these are cumulative. Um, it's not enough for it to be necessary. It's, we need to be looking at all of those things and overarching over all of that should be uh, the structures of democratic institutions, in particular democratic courts, independent judiciaries that can provide that kind of oversight. Thank you, David. Um, each of you in, in, in your current rules uh, has commented on uh, the ways uh, various governments uh, have attempted to regulate uh, different areas of content, uh, including uh, uh, hate speech, uh, extremist content and, and disinformation. Um, based on what you've seen, um, what are the pros and, and cons of attempting to provide a single overarching uh, regulatory regime for all forms of harmful content uh, versus creating a spe specific frameworks for each? Um, David, I will ask you to go first. Sure. You know, I, from my perspective, I think one of the, the, there are two areas where European regulation has, has missed pretty substantial opportunities to invest rule of law standards in the regulation of, uh, of social media um, or, or the internet and, and content, user generated content more generally. One is uh, finding ways to insert uh, their democratic institutions in the evaluation of, of these issues. Um, and, and the way that, that things have developed, that regulation has developed over the last several years has, has been essentially government saying, these are the rules. So this is the rule for hate speech, uh, or you need to follow our law on uh, criminal insults, for example, as in Germany. But it's up to you, the company, to adjudicate what is lawful and not under our laws. And, um, and what that has done has, has been to increase the pressure of the companies. So it's been paradoxical. Rather than restraining the companies, these moves, because they have not involved their, their institutions of governance, really, they have um, they've, they've, um, reinforced the power and the dominance of companies, you know, the only ones that can afford this kind of uh, self regulation. And at the same time, the other missed opportunity has been rigorous. Uh, disclosure and transparency requirements. And I think that we, we'd have a much better discussion globally, honestly, if, if we had uh, more transparency, more insight, in, not just into the rules that the companies are, are developing in any of the different areas that you mentioned, but if we had real transparency into how they enforce those rules. And no government has, has truly taken the step to enforce those transparency requirements. My hope is that that transparency becomes fundamental to the Digital Services Act, um, to future regulation in Europe and elsewhere. 
and that's that's the opportunity that that we've missed so far and that hopefully will be a part of the discussion moving forward thank you and um adunya uh, how do you see these uh, pros and cons and perhaps also at the national level well um, as as we know uh, in recent years uh, national legislators in EU member states have been pushing for new laws um, to combat negative, I would say, societal phenomena such as uh, hateful or terrorist uh, content online. And we know about several examples. For example, uh, Avia Law in France, uh, inspired by the German Network Enforcement Act. Uh, that actually requires companies to remove manifestly legal content within 24 hours uh, from receiving a notification uh, about it, but also uh, the UK uh, white paper on online harm. So I would say that it is obvious that pros are that there is a need to combat uh, online abuses, uh, online hate speech, uh, legitimate objectives to fight against hatred, racism, anti-LGBTI uh, or other discriminatory content. Uh, it was stressed by uh, Council of Europe uh, monitoring body ECRI that action is required uh, in several areas to effectively prevent and combat hate speech. These encompass awareness raising, prevention and counter speech, support to victims, uh, self-regulation, the use of regulatory powers and as, as a last uh, uh, resort. Uh, criminal investigation and uh, uh, punishment. When it comes to cons, um, broad and sometimes vague definitions of what constitutes illegal content, uh, that is uh, something that I would uh, uh, say is quite important, including uh, phenomena such as online disinformation that we already mentioned and terrorist content, limited ability uh, of technologies to access uh, the context, shifting the focus from conditional intermediary liability to holding, inter uh, to holding intermediaries directly uh, responsible for the dissemination of illegal contact on their platform. Uh, thank you, Dunya. Um, uh, I have one uh, more question uh, and perhaps more uh, addressing uh, David, uh, because it touches upon something that you uh, uh, previously already indicated when you say that we have a global discussion of transparency and that you were hoping that that's also becoming part of the DSA discussion. So with the GDPR, uh, we saw EU legislation uh, can have a uh, impact beyond European borders, uh, has a so-called Brussels effect. And so do you think the DSA has impact beyond Europe? And if so, what implications, uh, if any, um, should that effect have on the DSA deliberations? Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a really important question because I think, as you, as you know, GDPR has had a global impact, both in the context of how the companies now deal with privacy issues, not just in Europe, but worldwide. Uh, it's, it's had that very real kind of impact in, you know, in positive and, and potentially surprising and <laughs> negative ways. But it's been, generally speaking, a, a European regulation that, that has had global impact. Also, it's been a kind of model for, for many states adopting their own privacy regulations. And I think that the DSA has that potential. Um, and it has that potential for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, of course, Europe has pretty significant market share. And so because the companies operate at scale, what they're going to want to do is looking at the, the regulation that is imposed on them in Europe, it makes sense for them to apply that across the board. So European regulation will almost certainly have a kind of extraterritorial if not global impact. And I think you know, for that reason, the companies should be paying really close attention to this. They should be engaging, but it's not just the companies. I think individuals who are interested in internet regulation around the world should be participating in this kind of regulatory discussion. They should be engaging you know, to the extent that, that the European process, which is typically quite open to, to comment, from experts and uh, from civil society around the world, people should be people should be engaging in that, and they should be drawing from from the European experience 
the good lessons, and also highlighting for European legislators, European policymakers, the negative impacts that certain kinds of discussions can have. So when the discussion around extremism or terrorist content um, uh, is, is too vague and is too much of a, a focus on the punishment and the penalization side, that feeds into efforts around the world to impose penalties on individuals for their speech, which tend to be used against critics and dissenters and journalists. And so I think that that kind of feedback loop between Europeans and the rest of the world will be essential to ensuring that this is a, this is a, a new regulatory regime that actually works for people around the world. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, I will now turn things back over to Jason uh, for moderating the discussion uh, to build on these very useful opening uh, remarks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Judith. Thank you, David and Dunya, for those excellent remarks. Um, it's my pleasure now to moderate uh, an excellent panel that will uh, build on those comments. Uh, and I'm going to start by introducing our distinguished panelists. Agustina del Campo is the director of the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information, CELE, at the University of Palermo in Buenos Aires, and a leading global expert on freedom of expression. CELE was one of the first academic centers to join GNI in 2011. Uh, Francois Javier Dussart, better known as FX, is senior director of EU public policy at Verizon Media, based in Brussels. Verizon Media is the successor company to Yahoo, which was a founding member of GNI. And then Jens Hendrik Jeppesen is Director of European Affairs at the Center for Democracy and Technology, CDT, which was also a founding member of GNI. I was thinking, let me start with you. How do you think the DSA, this builds off the last question to David, um, how do you think the DSA could impact content regulation outside of Europe? And what do you hope EU lawmakers take into consideration as they deliberate on the DSA? Hi, Jason, and hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation and for organizing this panel. Um, it's a real uh, privilege to be here with you. Um, this really falls nicely from what David just, uh, just said. Um, Europe has been a pioneer in in legislating a lot of the most complex questions that we have faced in uh, freedom of expression and content circulation broadly uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, Latin America, and I think the rest of the world as well, uh, but Latin America is particularly permeable to discussions that happen uh, in Europe and has been particularly permeable um, in adopting a lot of the issues that Europe has dealt with in their own legislative sp spheres. So we've seen uh, a flourishment uh, or we've seen bills of law flourishing across Latin America following a lot of the European uh, efforts on legislation, uh, particularly on content moderation. Um, this has created uh, a number of different things. Uh, Latin America doesn't have a broad uh, protection uh, or a broad regime, basically, for intermediary liability. So as, um, as opposed to the US that has CDA 230, or Europe, which had the e-commerce directive, in Latin America, we don't have a, a regional law on this, and most countries in the region don't really have a general broad uh, law on intermediary liability. So in thinking about the positive aspects of what the DSA effort uh, might bring, I think it's an effort that could provide some clarity as to where the e-commerce directive stands vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the laws uh, and, and different efforts that have uh, flourished in Europe in the last couple of years, and um, provide a clear stance on uh, the safe harbor and the obligations to monitor. Uh, I think that um, the DSA could be um, an interesting tool 
to point clearly to where Europe should uh, cease where the uh, focus for regulation should be. Should it be on the substantial? Should it be on the process? Uh, like David was saying, it's an opportunity to focus on transparency. What would I like to see uh, coming out of this process? I would like to see a clear distinction between illegal and harmful content. Um, I think that line has blurred a lot in the past four years, and there needs to be uh, a clear stance from the from Europe, but globally, um, on what is it that they are trying to to regulate and how. Um, the other thing that I would like to see are clear uh, and strict analyses on the necessity and proportionality of the measures they adopt. Um, I would like, on this point, to see a careful approach on how uh, the European Union plans to export this loss. Um, it's, it's not, um, it didn't just happen that GDPR got a global uh, impact. Uh, and it probably won't just happen that the European uh, Copyright Directive might have a huge influence on debates around copyright issues. Um, there is an active effort to export um, these laws, and it makes sense. Europe has been a pioneer on these issues. And um, as David was just saying, we should be drawing lessons learned and and uh, good practices from those from those efforts, um, but I think there should be a careful um, approach to how these laws um, are are exported, uh, taking good care of the necessity and proportionality analysis that may vary from one region to the other. Uh, finally, I would like to join Dunia in uh, my serious concern as to what might happen with um, COVID-19 developments. Um, I think having this discussion within this particular framework that we're currently in um, is it's interesting on the one side, but there are a lot of things happening and this process might very well get sidetracked um, by a number of the different conversations that are happening today vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. Um, so I'll keep an eye uh, on on how that how the measures that are being implemented and how what's happening with this health crisis, particularly online, uh, impacts the um, development of the DSA. Thanks again. Thanks, Agustina. <clears throat> I, I know that uh, Dunya and David are keeping a, a close eye on that, and, and GNI is as well. And um, hopefully, uh, together, all of us can um, ensure that uh, the efforts that are being undertaken in response to the pandemic are done in the most lawful and rights uh, enabling manner. Um, FX, let me turn next to you. You represent a technology company that offers diverse products and services. Most of the content regulation that we've seen around the world is primarily focused on social media platforms, but we have seen how many of those efforts can nonetheless apply broadly to a whole suite of products and services. What concerns do you have about the way that the DSA could unintentionally impact services like search or news aggregation, for example? Thanks, Jason, and thanks for inviting me to this discussion. Um, so before I answer this question, it's quite important indeed to give you all a bit more indications about Verizon Media and our services, because this will explain a little bit more how we look at these issues. Um, so Verizon Media is indeed a media and tech company born from the reunion of Yahoo and AOL under the umbrella of Verizon. So first, as a company, we always look at policy developments um, with regard to their potential impact on human rights. So as you mentioned, Yahoo was one of the founding members of the GNI and Verizon Media remains a GNI member today. Second, and that's a very important thing to keep in mind in terms of our approach, we indeed have a wide range of services. So we produce and share digital content through our brands. So TechCrunch, HuffPost, Yahoo News, we offer search engine services um, and communication tools such as Yahoo Mail. 
So with all this in mind, we indeed approach the DSA debate with a very holistic view. Um, and specifically on DSA, David gave a very good description of the main dynamics in Europe and the concerns uh, of policymakers regarding social media. Now, elaborating a little bit further on this, and specifically to your question, Jason, um, what I find really concerning is the clear indication that some policymakers seem to look at content regulation from the sole angle of social media, because that's where all the kind of you know, heat can be observed, I would say, then define extremely strict obligations on this basis, but then apply them to all types of services where the interactions could be totally different compared to social media. And this creates a wide range of issues, starting with an obvious lack of proportionality and negative impact on human rights. Um, a very good example, and I'm sure that most of you uh, know about it, and Junia mentioned it very briefly, but um, a good example is the French law to combat hateful content on the internet um, that has just been adopted a couple of days ago. Uh, I think to be clear and to go back to you know what Junia has mentioned, David, I think it's really clear that there is a need to address this type of content. Um, because those issues are real and are faced by the society. Uh, but it has to be done in a very balanced way to avoid unintended consequences. To give you one specific example, so the French law creates an obligation for service providers to remove illegal content within 24 hours when flagged by a user. So from that perspective, and I'm sure, again, most of you know, it's kind of similar to the German bill uh, to tackle illegal uh, hateful content. So this creates obviously a lot of issues for social media in terms of balancing the rights at stake when the platform is exposed to significant fines uh, and may take the decision to avoid remove content to limit its risk. But the issue with France is that, for example, this obligation also applies to such providers. And I think that's a really, really dangerous trend um, that we have to factor in the upcoming discussions on the ESA. Uh, Clearly here, the situation becomes even more disproportionate as it is almost impossible to de-index a specific hateful statement without making inaccessible all the rest of a page or website, even though it is lawful, um, and thus posing an even greater risk to the freedom of expression. Um, as you all know, I think, you know, looking at the dynamic in Europe, uh, France and Germany are really clear drivers of the agenda that is debated and will be debated over the next few months and years. And we, I mean, as a community, really have to engage with policymakers to keep explaining the, the reason why those kind of, you know, very broad approach without any kind of nuance is extremely detrimental to freedom of expression and, uh, and fundamental rights. So at this stage, we do hope that the discussions at your level will give a little bit more opportunities to bring back the balance to this debate, but that's indeed a very dangerous trend that we are we are facing at this stage. Um, and I will, I will leave it with that. Thank you, and, and um, really uh, interesting and important observation, FX. Uh, Jens, uh, finally, you've been following tech policy issues in the EU for quite a while now, and I'd like to ask for your reflections on the lessons you think policymakers should draw from the various regulatory and voluntary efforts um, that have been launched uh, to address harmful content uh, over the last few years. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to do that. I, I can certainly talk about the lessons that they have drawn. Uh, and then uh, what we think they, they should draw. Uh, and, and so first of all, th th there has been, as others have said, a, a flurry of legislative and uh, non-legislative initiatives to deal with uh, uh, digital platforms, both in terms of their economic impact and, on, and the impact on the information space and democracy and media plurality and so on. But, but let me just highlight a couple of things that, that I think will inform the, the DSA. So uh, the, 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 the EU passed the um, Audiovisual Media uh, Services Directive, uh, which obliges video sharing platforms to prevent and moderate content that might be considered hate speech harmful to children 
and, and then it gives national uh, uh, media regulators authority to verify the platforms are carrying out these duties uh, in, the, in, uh, in codes of conduct. So that's one thing. Uh, another, another piece is the terrorist content online regulation, which creates new duties of care and proactive obligations uh, on content hosts to prevent content that, that may or may not be categorized as terrorist based on fairly vague uh, definitions. And then it introduces heavy fines if companies fall short. Um, uh, the third one I would highlight is, is platform to business regulation. Uh, this one sets rules for platforms, uh, terms and conditions to be clear and understandable and spell out clearly how these terms and conditions will be enforced. Restriction, termination of accounts. Uh, it also has rules on algorithmic transparency of ranking and recommendation systems and access to dispute resolution. So these are things that we would see and no, in, in the DSA uh, debate as well. Uh, but anyhow, the, the lessons that, that policymakers have drawn is that all of these have not been sufficient uh, to deal with uh, problems of illegal and harmful content, and that uh, they require a more holistic and comprehensive reform, which will involve the, the e-commerce uh, directive. Um, so uh, just a couple more observations. In the last six months, I think we've seen a very clear focus on addressing concerns about market dynamics in digital services. So ex ante rules specifically uh, targeting the very largest global platforms. And then also an increasing attention on online marketplaces in addition to, uh, to the social media space uh, with, with trade in physical goods. Uh, so something that both consumer groups and uh, brands uh, industries have highlighted. So um, in terms of the future uh, uh, the DSA negotiations uh, and our recommendations, we set out nine principles last year that have been our sort of uh, 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 guiding uh, uh, document for advocacy uh, in, uh, since last year. And so I'll just highlight three. Um, First is, uh, and this is something David Kay uh, uh, explained very well, that when states, it, it's really about fundamental rule of law principles. And so that when states want to restrict or suppress uh, content, they need to respect uh, basic human rights principles. And so if content is harmful enough to require state intervention, uh, then you have to be able to describe it clearly in legislation that is passed in the, in the parliamentary process. Um, respecting the, the, the necess necessity and proportionality uh, um, uh, conditions. It is not appropriate to delegate to a regulator uh, administrative powers to declare that lo otherwise lawful content is now harmful and must be suppressed. Um, the second is that we should maintain some of the core principles from the e-commerce directive. And that is the, 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 the principle of limited liability and the prohibition of laws that mandate general monitoring of user content uploads. They're really essential to uh, uh, free expression and access to information. And the DSA can keep these principles and still create harmonized notice and action uh, obligations and create transparency and accountability uh, of, uh, uh, of automated moderation tools that are being used. And then the final one is cross-border impact of content restrictions. Um, so what we see in Europe uh, uh, is that uh, uh, that uh, the e-commerce the e directive is silent on whether uh, a restriction of a, an injunction uh, against particular content may be imposed uh, in other countries. Um, and we think that there should be a clear principle in the DSA that says uh, the content restrictions based on the law of one member state should not be imposed uh, uh, across borders. There are very different traditions, very different historical and cultural norms in different European countries. We should not, uh, uh, we should not limit the space of permissible speech by imposing uh, all countries uh, 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 competing, uh, 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 let's say, blasphemy laws uh, on, on countries that don't have them. So um, I'll stop there and, and thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jens, in, in particular for raising that point about cross-border 
uh, impacts. I think that's been a theme running through many of the comments here. And I, I want to just highlight um, GNI put out a statement earlier this year uh, on that issue, and, and perhaps we can post that into the chat. Um, we have um, a few minutes remaining and a lot of great questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we will run a little bit past 11 for those who can stick with us. So um, uh, we'll try and get in as much as we can. I wanted to, all of these questions are addressed to, to the full group, panelists and speakers. Um, the first comes from uh, somebody who's working with one of the members of uh, the European Parliament on the DSA, and I'll just read it to you. We want to avoid that the DSA focuses on undefined harmful content. An idea that we have been thinking about is the creation of independent social media councils to allow public exchanges by diverse range of stakeholders on how social media networks should engage in content governance that is respectful of human rights. How and if would this make sense at a European level, and to what extent companies uh, should companies be a part of this, uh, and how do we avoid corporate capture? Um, David, I know you've been doing a lot of thinking writing on the issue of social media councils in particular, so uh, I'll turn things over to you first and then uh, open it up for any other reactions. Sure, thanks. It's a it's a really important question, and I think it's it's really important for for people to be thinking. I think, and by people, I mean all of us and uh, legislators and regulators as well, to be thinking that the regulatory environment doesn't have to be a kind of one size fits all approach. I mean, there are multiple uh, ways, multiple opportunities to have oversight. You can have a DSA that imposes some public standards, some public regulatory standards uh, on, on the environment. And I think that makes a lot of sense for transparency and disclosure purposes. Um, but you could also have, and, and that is to, to echo what a point that was just made, that includes keeping the basic principles of the e-commerce directive, but you could also have a kind of multi-stakeholder approach that's found in the social media councils that involves, similar to the way press councils work, a kind of oversight of content decisions. And, and if you have that, it doesn't exclude other models. Um, it ensures the kind of openness in the discussion of, of the hard problems around content, but it also doesn't include the kind of hard edge of penalty that, that might actually cause the, the companies uh, and individuals to overregulate, to self-censor themselves in a way that's negative for, uh, for the environment. So, so I think there's a lot of room for, for Europe to be considering the social media council model, even while it's addressing or, or pursuing the other issues in the DSA. Thanks, David. Any others want to come in on that idea of social media councils? Uh, okay, I want to go to another question. Um, uh, I, I'll keep this, the, the questioners uh, anonymous for now. Um, this one of the questioners asks uh, about the for elaboration on this concept of transparency and asks what uh, the speakers um, mean and, or, or what they think uh, we should mean when we refer to transparency. Transparency about what and transparency uh, to whom? Uh, users, public authorities, researchers, et cetera. And I will add transparency by whom. There's a lot of talk about uh, more transparency from companies, but certainly GNI has long advocated for corresponding transparency from governments. Um, so let me open it up and see who wants to come in on this issue of transparency. Any takers? Otherwise, I'll, I'll sign this question to Dunya. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we, we um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I think this was already elaborated in uh, um, both David, uh, uh, David and myself um, introduction. Um, I think transparency is absolutely the, the, the key. Uh, we were talking about uh, necessity and um, about proportionality. But to this, uh, I think it's extremely important to add also uh, the legality and transparency. Uh, any of these attempts uh, that are done without these particular safeguards uh, are not uh, good and cannot be considered uh, important. What I also think uh, is important to mention here is uh, uh, the fact that we do not need to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, we already have the tools and mechanisms 
Um, because sometimes I think in the situations where we have too many question marks, uh, we do not know, um, you know, in which direction we should go. So we immediately think of regulating and legislating, and we should not uh, over-regulate or over-legislate. Uh, we should use the tools uh, that we have and the knowledge uh, to ensure that technology benefits uh, and enhance human rights protection. And I would just here mention the document uh, that my office produced uh, last year, um, recommendations on artificial intelligence uh, that was uh, uh, published with the aim to assist uh, the states and the government. Uh, and it can be used uh, to that purpose. It is called Unboxing Artificial Intelligence and Human Rights. And it is based actually on existing standards and the work uh, done uh, by the Council uh, of Europe, other international organizations, and particularly taking into account uh, David's report on artificial uh, intelligence, uh, which I find uh, one of the greatest documents talking, uh, if probably not the, the one, the document that should actually give uh, all of us the guidance also uh, in the future when we talk about these uh, issues. Thanks very much, Dunya. And um, uh, indeed, I can second and recommend those documents. Um, we will um, we'll think about maybe we can circulate some of these documents, including uh, the unboxing document, uh, some of the other reports that you mentioned, David's report, um, uh, two panels separately. And I'm glad you, you brought up artificial intelligence as there were a couple of questions about that. Um, in the last minute that we have, I want to take a final question um, uh, near and dear to my heart, which is what about the abuse of uh, notice in action uh, frameworks, which uh, the, the questioner points out that we've seen this uh, as a problem in the context of copyright under the D uh, DMCA in the US uh, system. Um, what if we do have a notice in action system um, built uh, around the DSA, what steps can and should be taken to try and uh, avoid and, and address potential abuse of that kind of a system? Happy to take this one, uh, Please. Jason, if you want. Um, and I've been following and really heavily involved in the copyright reform and discussions at European level. So going back uh, on this, uh, from this perspective, um, clearly what is the big departure and you know the big change we see in those regulations and these discussions is really the, kind of the time frame associated to the obligation to remove the content. So with e-commerce directive, the time frame is basically the fact that, I mean, the platform has to um, take action as fast as possible uh, when they receive the notification, which is one thing and has been, we believe, I mean, could be you know, improved, but uh, potentially, but has been working. Now, if you move and if you corner a private actor to basically take this decision in a very short amount of time, 24 hours or even one hour uh, in, in certain scenarios, and this associated to a fine, you are indeed in the situation where you have, uh, you are in the situation in a, with a risk of censorship. So flexibility, I mean, flexibility or kind of, you know, logic in terms of what is the approach, what is the reasonable timing, it will be essential in this debate. Thanks. Um... David or, or anyone else who's looked at copyright law want to talk a little bit about um, counter notice and, and how effective that can be and some of the limitations that that might have? I'm happy to say, say a couple of words, um, I, although I, I would also like to hear from, from Jens and Augustina if they have a, a take on this. I, I mean, I would just say briefly that I think one of the, um, one of the risks, and we saw this, actually in throughout the debate in Europe around the, the new copyright directive, um, I mean, two different things. One, the kind of capture of that process by large industries and, and publishing houses to the detriment of individual artists and to the detriment of, uh, of, um, of the platforms to a certain extent, because, because what we have seen is a move towards, uh, in a way, kind of over-regulation and also a generalized pushing towards uh, what, we, what we haven't really talked about uh, that much, but uh, to upload filters uh, to the idea that, um, that there's a way in which the companies, the platforms can, um, can create a system that, 
that basically blocks us from uploading material, even in the absence of your normal notice and takedown. And, and that's, a, that's a real danger to, I, I think it's a very big danger to artistic freedom of expression. Uh, it's a danger to the, to the market for, uh, for, uh, for art uh, in all sorts of ways. And I think that, the, that Europe should be very careful about uh, and, and certainly avoid the kind of approach that we saw in, uh, in the copyright directive, somehow transporting that over into the DSA more generally. I could, I could add to that just a couple of observations that, that the DSA ought to uh, balance the framework around notice and action in, in, the, in a way that, that a notification does not, uh, does not imply the, uh, that the content is in fact illegal. It, and and a, a company should not be held or should not be punished for not following a notification. A, a company might be sanctioned if it fails if it simply ignores notifications for, you know, systematically, um, but there shouldn't be kind of the, this uh, this assumption, uh, and 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 the incentive should be balanced. So, uh, uh, like, so we should avoid the print the, the kind of layout that we've seen in some of the laws that we've talked about, where failure to remove a content that has been flagged that leads to fines. Uh, that that is not appropriate for this type of framework. So so. It should be much more balanced than that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, if I may add to that, um, I think it's really encouraging that we're that there are people uh, actually concerned about this. Uh, it seems that for a long time uh, there wasn't a huge or a serious concern about over reporting, um, particularly from the people that were legislating. This was not a concern. And I agree with um, David about the copyright directive, the EU copyright directive. And um, within that frame, framework, I think it's particularly important that we're asking this question. Um, I agree with what has been said about timeframes and liability of companies as being very important for uh, addressing this particular issue. And I also think transparency can go a long way here. Uh, when we answered the question about uh, transparency of what, I think of rules of processes and of implementation uh, of those processes, both vis-a-vis uh, -vis state action and vis-a-vis uh, -vis company action. And I think transparency can go a really long way in clarifying how this abusive reporting happens. Um, how often do companies see it? What, how big of a problem is it um, so that it can be addressed in a more holistic and realistic kind of way? Wonderful. Well, thank you all. Thank you to uh, the many participants who have stuck around for this uh, bonus period, extra few minutes. Um, this has really been a, a really wonderful conversation. I want to thank in particular our speakers and panelists uh, and thank all of you for participating. We very much look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you uh, in the context of the DSA and other efforts to regulate content. Um, and with that, uh, I will uh, close this out and um, wish you all a wonderful rest of your days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.